All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we have here today Adam Teixeira Bonfi, who's going to talk about effective dynamics and instability of black holes, one over dimension expansion. This is uh, the master thesis that he completed. So, Adam, whenever you want, for yours. Oh, thank you. So, this is a did it with a researcher there at the University of Barcelona, Roberto Emparan García Salazar, which is also uh, there working at the Institute for Sciences of Cosmos. And so just first to start, I wanted to say that the, the thesis that I did was uh, it consisted on reproducing the equations analysis of this uh, reference here that by the supervisor, also Ritako Suzuki and Kentaro Danabe and doing it from zero and about doing all the details of the deductions. So with this set, I will start with uh, the outline of what I present. Uh, just first I will introduce the gravity in large number of dimensions and what I motivated and some concepts for afterwards. Then I will explain how we get the effective dynamics and what are they of black holes in higher dimensions and their generalization which are black B brains. And we will use this, for example, to simulate the instabilities of black strings. This is an important problem. And we will end with the conclusions. So first, in general relativity, we have these impressive uh, possibilities that, can have, um, that we can study, uh, supernovas or mergers of black holes but they are really difficult to simulate with computers. They need a lot of computing power. So this can be a problem. So a question that we could ask is, uh, can we simplify the physics so it is possible to use less computing power? And one way to do so, a method that is usually used, is to expand in a small parameter. So in quantum electrodynamics, we expand in uh, uh, alpha, the, the fine structure constant. So we go to a regime of small electromagnetic interaction. In general relativity, there is a parameter that we can also use, but it's a bit more hidden, which is the dimension of space-time, uh, d, so called d. Uh, what we can do is expand in 1 over d. So we go to a regime of large dimension of space-time. And we can do this because general relativity is well-defined for any space-time dimension larger than 4. And when we get, when we do this expansion, is we get uh, effective dynamics at large dimension. And they allow us to do a, uh, with a quick simulation on a, even a personal laptop. We can see the evolution of objects that are massive and complicated uh, under general relativity. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and besides this simplification, there are more reasons why gravity in more than four dimensions is interesting. So there, I will give three of them, but they are given in more detail in this reference down here. And uh, first, a string theory that is possible theory of everything, of course, contains gravity, and it has more than four space and dimensions. And so there is the ADS CFT correspondence, which relates a black hole in D dimensions with the quantum field theory and a dimensional lens. And also, it's useful to get insights about GR itself. And so when we go with gravity of more than four space and dimensions, we have new types of black objects. Uh, in three dimensions, in four space and dimensions, we have the black hole, which is localized in a region of space. The event horizon is a given region, as is image here. But in higher dimensions, we can have black brains, black P brains, which are extended in P dimensions of space. So for instance, if we take a simple case, a black string, it's extended in one dimension of space. And a representation could be this image here on the right. And this one would be a uniform black string because the event horizon has the same thickness everywhere. Also, just uh, as a comment, these, these representations here are just 3D slices because we are talking about higher dimensional objects which cannot be represented uh, easily. Uh, another new thing is that we have uh, new topologies for black holes. With this, I mean in four dimensions, black holes are always spheres. Uh, it can be a squished the spheres if your black hole is rotating, but uh, they never have a hole. But when we go to more than four space ten dimensions, there can be holes in the horizons of black holes, as this image on here of a black ring. And an intuition for how we can get this uh, could be if we take the uniform black string here and we wrap it around, 
and make it spin so it doesn't collapse under its own gravity, it kind of gives an intuition of how could we get the black rings when we are on higher dimensions. Also, uh, I think it will be important for the presentation that we will use is the concept of instabilities of black strings. So these were found by Ruth Gregory and Raymond Laflamme. And they found that the uniform black strings that I presented before are in general unstable. What happens is that they develop ripples that grow in their event horizons. And however, it's difficult to say how these ripples will grow and what will be the final fate of these ripples. And even though this phenomenon has wide implications for physics of black holes in higher dimensions and for ideas of duality, as I mentioned before. At the same time, there are stable but non-uniform black strings as the one in this image here. So the event horizon has not the same thing as everywhere when we are at a high enough dimension of space-time, above a critical dimension of space-time, which can be 14. For instance. And an important thing to make these non-uniform black strings stable is that the direction along the string, uh, we take it to be periodic or compactified. So if we go through the right on the graph here, we come through the left and vice versa. And so a question we can ask here, is when we have these stable and non-uniform black strings, could they be the end point of the evolution of the instabilities that Gregory and Laflamme found? And so this will be a question that we'll be asking in this presentation. So first we'll start with uh, getting the effective dynamics and presenting effective dynamics of black P-range and black holes. This will be the objective of this section. And just so to be in the same page, I will be using a bit of uh, notation. Uh, this will be coordinates here. Sigma A will be the directions along the P brain, the spatial directions along the P brain. Uh, there are P of them, of course, uh, which is signified with this index, which goes from one to P. And T stands for the time. And altogether, these uh, all directions, they make the world volume directions of the brain, the space di directions and the time direction in, in the brain. So now I will give uh, an outline, there's a brief outline of how the effective dynamics are reduced. And to do so, first we, we started with a metric concept. So I guess for the metric, that it's inspired for the by the metric of the uniform black p brain uh, boosted, so it is moving. And so to make it cleaner to write, we just define this, this end here which is a combination of D with some finite numbers. And the important thing is that N grows the same way as D. So if we go to large D, we go to large N. And we can perform the expansion on either of them. And just, uh, I will just give the important things about this metric is we have it that it's uh, spherically symmetric in N plus one directions. This is indicated by the last term here. And all the other terms, what they represent is the shape of the uniform P brain and its movement also. And once we have this metric as considered, we then solve the Einstein's equations in vacuum for this metric to get the coefficients on the metric. And we do it in vacuum because as for black holes, except at the singularity, the space-time is void. And the same happens for black pea brains. So this just has some steps. The first is to do a spherical reduction. So we take advantage of the radial symmetry to uh, get away with some, to, to uh, sorry, to reduce the number of equations that we have to solve. Then we expand the metric, the coefficients of the metric in powers of the, expansion parameter, one over n, one over d. And with this, we are able then to solve the instance equations at leading and next to leading order in the expansion parameter. And when we do this, all this process, what we get is the effective dynamics. And these effective dynamics are the dynamics of some variables that appear, which describe the shape of the uh, P ring that I will explain now. 
So the variables that we get are M, which uh, depends on the wall volume position. So it did indicate the size of the horizon at a certain point, and equivalently, the energy density of the energy horizon at a certain point. Also, there is PA, which th there are P of them, one for each direction, spatial direction of the brain. And they indicate the momentum density, so the movement in the direction A of the P brain. And these variables, they get, after we solve the equations, they get these dynamics down here. These are nonlinear dynamics. They are the effective dynamics of black brains in higher number of dimensions. And a nice thing of the, about these equations is that they are continuity equations. It can be seen readily. And uh, since they are continuity equations, the variables M and the variables PA, they stand for quantities that uh, when we integrate them, they are conserved. So they are really analogous to, ma to energy density and to momentum density. And now we just uh, consider some checks that we do to see if these dynamics uh, behave as we expect. And we do so by going to a simple case, uh, which is the black string. So we get only one extended direction, which we call Z. And the momentum along this direction, we call it P. And what we do is an analysis of small perturbations of the event horizon of this uh, black string. So the energy density here, we perturb it with uh, delta M, so a small perturbation indicated by delta, which oscillates with this exponential here. And we also perturb the momentum with a small perturbation that also oscillates in the same way. And if we apply the previous nonlinear equations of the effective dynamics, we get that the only possible frequencies are these one, two here, these two ones here, which depend on the wave number of the perturbation. And it turns out that- Sorry, uh, Adam, quick question. I don't understand yeah. seven. So it's K square with K. What is, what, what is that? What is the dimension? What are the units of omega? Um, it's k wave number, so it's dimension full, then it cannot be added with k square, right? So maybe I'm missing something. It, looking at six, k has units of one over z. Yes, so sir. then you're getting k one over z minus something that goes like uh, units of one over z square. Yeah, sorry. I think it's because uh, I didn't say it, but uh, the I take the, the velocity of light to be one. And then still Z has then, units. If it has the case, Z has units. T has units of time, sets of units of space, right? Of, so K has units of one over Z. It's a wave number, spatial frequency. Yeah, we don't think that K has yeah, units, otherwise K is smaller than one there would make no sense, right? Agreed, agreed. But that's my question, right? Because in six, K is multiplying Z, and Z doesn't seem to be a dimensionless quantity, it seems to be a spatial coordinate. Isn't that right? So I'm missing the constant. I'm missing the constants that are being taken one. That's all. Yeah, I think it's because there should be the constant of light, the, the speed of light here. Because so, so if I take the speed but of the speed light, of light is dimensionless. Light. That wouldn't fix the problem. Speed of light. Do you said g? Do you said g equals one? I don't. Okay, that's a g. Because yeah. if you said g equals one, then everything is, is dimensionless anyway. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. That's what I I wanted to hear. Okay. You're taking g equals one as well in here. Adam, is that correct? Yes, yes, I'm also taking g equals one. So you also have to take h bar equals one? Yeah, h bar and g, otherwise yeah. it makes no sense. Yeah. It has to be everything. So, yeah. so everything there is in units of blank energy. So k is yeah. smaller than blank energy is equivalent to k is smaller than one. I really, I mean, I know that's very popular. I really don't like blank units. I, I, I want to give at least one scale that connects me to the physics uh, mm -hmm. again. Good. If you're working in Planck units, then everything has the same units. Everything is dimensionless here. So, fair enough. Yeah. But it connects to the to the, to the physics, right? I mean, no, it's just that the, it's so, just the so, distance is measured in short no, radius. Let me put it like that. <laughs> so, uh, M of the black hole could be energy, it could be length. So, you could compare it with a gap of the detector, with a length scale of the detector. And you get very confused uh, often if it's a size effect or if it's an energy effect, for example. 
Uh, it's nice not to work with at least one scale. Natural units for me are the best. Now we can discuss it in a different, in a different case. I mean, there are arguments for the other. Plant units, uh, removing, all the, removing all the dimensions from everything makes things complicated to interpret. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yes, I see. Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, so in plant units, uh, again, I, I need to think of interpreting k minus k square is not something that I can do straightforward because of the constant that are missing. But okay, I go. Yeah, I see. I see now what you meant. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. And well, the, the thing here is that when we take k to be less than one, uh, there are one of these possible frequencies which becomes uh, positive after we multiply it with the corresponding coefficient that it has in the exponential. So we get a growing exponential. So we got an, an unstable mode uh, as the which corresponds directly to the instability that Gregory and Laflamme found. And so this uh, is telling us that is this working out. So this study is all fully classical, right? Yes. So yeah, I think that it's philosophically less justified to take h bar equal one. Would you need to do this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Yeah, okay. So now we will apply the, the equations that I gave to simulate the instabilities of black strings. So we can answer the question at the start of the talk. And so this will, I will do it in the way that was done in also in the reference that I gave at the start. And uh, what we will do is to simulate numerically the equations for black strings. So these are the previous equations, but simplified to, well, particularized, sorry, to the case of black strings. And it's easy to solve them with a quick execution of Mathematica and dissolve. It just takes seconds. Hey, sorry. And one thing that we have to set before doing the simulation is what will be the initial conditions, the starting conditions of the black string. So we will take a uniform black string again, and we will perturb it slightly. And now we don't care about the shape of the distortion of the perturbation as long as it's small. And uh, we consider just to make it explicit uh, that when we have the the m one, so the the sorry, the energy density one, the radial position of the event horizon is also at one. So we have a fixed position of the event horizon. And another thing that we do is we compactify this at direction as. Don't, as I said in the introduction, just uh, so we take the z direction to be finite, we take it to have a length l, and we make it periodic. And we parameterize this periodicity so it's easier to make comparisons with the following wave number here, which is 2 pi over the length l. Also, since we said, as I said before, the horizon at a certain radial distance. And then when we take a larger KL, the string will be shorter. And so we will have a thicker black string. And this will be the way that I will be talking now about the results of the simulation. But, so we, uh, one, yeah. one quick thing, uh, if you're doing so solving numerically, it's not that you take arbitrary M of Z, you need, you need to give a specific form to the perturbation, no? For the yeah, I will, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not arbitrary. Uh, yeah, I do it for some uh, perturbations. I, guess, uh, I choose some of them, yeah. uh, several different. Sorry. Mm. So uh, we start with the case of a string that is thick. So we take a KL larger than one. And this, what it makes is that it's not due to the periodicity. It makes it impossible to have unstable modes on this string. And it turns out that, well, for, a, for an example, yes, so we take a, 
an initial perturbation here on the top. At time zero, uh, we have a small bump on the energy density of the black string. So that in the vertical direction is the direction along the string, and the horizontal direction is the size of the horizon, m. And as time passes, the, as we expect, the uh, develop the, the perturbation decreases and the string eventually becomes uniform because of no possible unstable modes. And here on the bottom, we see a representation of this in a single picture of all the evolution. So as we go to the right, we go towards the future. And in the vertical direction is um, the energy density. And the z direction is the other, this other one here. And this will be the way that we will be representing from now on the evolutions of the strings. And so, yeah, not for all initial perturbations, but for several different initial perturbations, the black string uh, decays and becomes uniform. And it happens generally. It doesn't, we don't find a case that this doesn't happen. So then we go for the case of uh, black string with, uh, which is a bit thinner with a KL between one and 0 0.5. And so what we find is that we take a small perturbation uh, that it cannot be seen uh, with the eye here on the closer to the screen. And as we go towards the future, so to inside of the screen, uh, the perturbation, uh, well, the string eventually develops a, a blob, which uh, stops evolving at some point. And so it becomes a stable, it becomes a uh, non-uniform string, which is stable in the end. And a blob forms uh, trying different initial perturbations. We always get kind of this a blob forming. And this is also a bit forced that only a single blob can develop because of the thickness that we, did, that we choose of the string. There is only one possible unstable mode which kind of corresponds with the only one block forming. Then we have the, for a th even thinner black string, we can have multiple unstable modes. We, this is for KLs smaller than 0 0.5. And what we found is that, for instance, here, we have two initial perturbations that are Gaussian, that we put them in the string. They are separated. They are on these two parts here. They are on, on, op on opposite sides of the string, kind of. And as time passes, these two perturbations, these two initial Gaussian perturbations grow, both of them. And eventually they get attracted and they start going towards each other. And they eventually collide and also in the end form a single blob as we go towards the future. And also with several different initial perturbations, we usually get this single blob in the end. At some points, a bit of uh, more than one block can develop, but it's difficult to say if they are stable because they can eventually track us these two cases here. So just to now conclude, uh, what we did in the talk is to first to introduce the importance of gravity in the large number of dimensions. And we reproduce the equations and the analysis of the reference here, the evolution and endpoint of black string stability, that's the solution. And this was done by deducing the effective dynamics of p brains at large dimension and simulating numerically the instabilities of black strings. And so we found that when we have, well, this we have some numerical ev evidence that when we have unstable uh, black strings, this happens for thin black strings, uh, they eventually become a non-uniform and stable uh, black string. When we are at a large enough dimension, so these effective dynamics are uh, correct. They can be applied. And there are some ways we can further this study. So one way is to correct the effective dynamics uh, by adding higher orders in one over D. In this way, we can get more accurate, more accurate results and get closer also to the the equals four dimensions where we live. And there is also the possibility of using these effective dynamics to study the collisions of black holes. As the last uh, image that I show suggested, 
that we can study them as collisions of blobs in black brains. And this was explored, this is being, uh, has been explored and is being explored in these two references down here. And so with this, I finish and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dan. Right. Um, there are questions. I have questions. Um, do you know if you can be sure, uh, being Einstein equations as they are, do you know whether an expansion in one over D is convergent? I mean, I know, I know that you can take it formally and just throw out things, but do you know that this is a non, it's a non linear system of equations, right? I find it difficult to evaluate whether you can actually say something about D equals four by taking higher orders. Uh, for that, you need to guarantee that you have some notion of convergence of the uh, preservative expansion in one over D. Do you know if that's been studied or looked at? I think that's an important question to know the answer to, whether that there's a, you can guarantee that these things, con the, the, the expansion converges and converges to the solution. Ideally, you can check how it recovers the D equals four case in some simple scenario, at least, at the very least, having some evidence that taking enough terms, you're approaching D equals four. It's just because it's not linear equations, so who knows, right? I mean, we know even with linear systems that you have problems with convergence when you do perturbative expansion, depending on many different factors. Um, I wonder if this is the case or not, if, if you know if this is the case. So uh, I don't know, or I'm sorry, or I don't remember. Uh, yeah, that sounds like an important question. Um, I, I think yeah. that at least to make people at least happy with it, without proving it, if, you, if, if maybe a proof exists, maybe we just didn't know. But if if not, showing that you can actually recover anything in D equals four <laughs> in an expansion like this, you know, even in a simple setting would be good. Yeah. Um, without that, uh, there's always the problem that, okay, it's nice to take expansions. Sometimes taking the expansion and solving the equations don't commute. <laughs> we can then, you don't have uniform convergence. So um, maybe you're solving the equations and they have nothing to do with um, the low D regime. For that, I need to know if the series converges and it converges to the right solution everywhere. So I, I get that the equations converge to that in the limit. I wonder if um, the solutions do. Let, let me put it like that. Yeah. Yeah. I... Maybe the answer to this is already known. No? I'm just saying that maybe that's something that you should ask the people who, I mean, Roberto, right? I mean, yeah. That's something that should be known. Yeah. So there is a review about this topic, and there is more than one way to take this limit. And I know that it has not been shown that the more than one way to take this limit, it has not been shown. Well, there are two at least, and it has not been shown that they are equivalent. Oh, well, then it kind of strengthens the point of skepticism that this will converge to the right thing. <laughs> yeah, so I know that they are kind of uh, used more for one type of problem or one other type of problem, like... Um, okay, this is about, then let me formulate the question. Do we know, reformulate, do we know if a uh, one over D expansion works the way it should, recovers the right limit in the, in the small D case? That, is there even numerical evidence that that's the case? I don't know. Uh, I think, well, maybe, well, they have been, they have used, um, uh, I know about an article that they have used to compute the, these, these uh, instabilities of black strings for higher orders with higher orders of the expansion and they go closer to to the critical dimension that I mentioned before and they also recover this critical dimension I think if I remember well okay and they study cases that are close to uh, d equals four okay well maybe that's something to ask in the future what are, what is the clear cut evidence that this expansion is legit you know that expanding the equation will lead to solutions that in the limits when you undo, uh, uh, when, you, when you take more terms, I would convert to the right solution. That is not guaranteed a priori, I can tell you that. And that is non-trivial, it's a non-trivial mathematical problem. Yeah. 
That's right. It, it already happens with linear systems and one integral, you know? <laughs> we have problems in perturbation theory in very simple quantum mechanics that the integral and the expansion may not, the integral in the equation and the expansion in the equation may not commute in some cases. Yeah. Another question that I have is what is the, so can you summarize what would be the interest of this? Uh, because certainly the objects that you're studying do not exist in the case of the equals four. So is, is this uh, assuming that there might be hidden extra dimensions in reality and that's the interest or is there a different interest? Because it's not that you're studying things that when you go to the equals four, answer some questions that we don't know. These things, these structures don't really exist on the equal four. So is the assumption that there might be extra dimensions somehow and then this would tell us something about it. What, what is the interest for somebody? I mean, I can see the mathematical interest. I said, like, oh, this is a cool problem to understand better. I can also see the interest in theories in physics with extra dimensions, but still a space time background, in particular string theory. Mm -hmm. Is that the interest in the physics point of view? Is through string theory, or is there any other physical interest for somebody that just wants to understand gravity in our universe? So, well, there is also the the, the idea is CFT correspondence. Mm -hmm. It is a bit useful in that regard. Well, how how would this connect regard. with the CFT correspondence? Well, so in in the sense that if we take a quantum field theory in four dimensions, then we can relate this to gravity in five dimensions. So yeah. we can study objects of gravity in five dimensions. Yeah, it's not, it would require a higher a really higher or higher order expansion, but it would be the same kind of objects that appear, the black strings. Um, uh, so, well, there is this, there is this part of studying the, 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 the dynamics on the, on the brains as so, so of, of, uh, of blobs on the brains as black hole, as merger of black holes, as a model for merger of black holes, which I don't know the accuracy. Oh, what, sorry, a model for merger, you say? Okay. Yeah, so, so, yeah, okay. to, to consider that perturbations on the brains, so uh, higher energy density on a part of the brain, to consider them as a model for a black hole. So if we have two blobs on the brain, they can be considered as two black holes, and the merger of the blobs on the brain is uh, analogous to, to a merger of two black holes. And it also has, I guess, it has similar dynamics. So, so it, you can also see how the blobs evolve after collision. And okay, but that thing should be proven wrong or right by, um, by LIGO, right? In the sense that they will have a different spectrum of gravitational wave emission, no? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I think it should be compared with with actual mergers of black holes, yeah. as, calc as computed by by general relativity in four dimensions, to see uh, how much it's uh, how much similar they are, or how which things can be qualitatively at least uh, extracted. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, these are these these two. These two articles down here do this thing, do this uh, exploration. I I haven't read them, however, but okay. this, uh, good. Yeah, nice. Also, I am still I will remain still skeptical about the ability of getting closer to the equals four at all uh, until maybe you answer that question eventually. <laughs> yeah, it's just difficult to take for somebody who I mean again I don't know that much about the field, right? So everything is all very well justified. I'm just skeptical based on my experience of working with much simpler things where these kind of expansions don't really converge the way they should. Um, take perturbation theory for an unharmonic an, an oscillator, right? That thing actually works really well up to order 50 or so if the constant is one over the constant, uh, coupling constant, and then after that it diverges ridiculously because the expansion uh, does not commute uh, with the solid dynamics. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there is also an interesting thing that is explained in which there is explained in this article here that gives the motivations for gravity in more than four dimensions. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I think it's this black hole topologies, these new types of black hole topologies that it's not, it's not in, in four dimensions, we could think that black holes shouldn't have holes and then these new types of topologies, I, I don't remember well, but they have, they can have new, well, new understanding that general relativity doesn't need to have uh, event horizons that are spheres. In reality, it's just yeah, in, high dimensions. Four dimensions. in high dimensions, yeah. Yeah, like it's like seeing that is a quirk of four dimensions that we have only spherical black holes. There are many things that are weird about four dimensions. It's the smallest number of dimensions where we can have tidal forces, for example. I don't know. I find that even more curious. <laughs> tidal forces you can have only for four or more. So anyway, I don't know. All right. I'll have more questions. Any other any other questions, anyone? Uh, I do have a question. I mean, it's it's not regarding the work itself. It's it's very cool, but I don't know. Are, are you going to, to keep uh, working on these stuff? In Waterloo, or are you like done with it? Like you're not going to touch the topic anymore. Uh, so at the moment, I I'm not planning right now to work on it, but it looks interesting. And maybe yeah, it, I also know about there is more things to research about it that the supervisor told me about. So. If there is any way of uh, doing something about it, yeah, I would like it. Mm. But at the moment, right now, not. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Well, in that case, let's thank uh, Adam again. of the recording.